Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to someone of my age, 9-11 is a matter of current affairs. A friend of mine's firm was on one of the top floors of the South Tower, and that day they lost 66 out of 170 employees. And other friends of mine have told me how they spent days scouring hospitals in the dust in New York looking for survivors. And I vividly remember, as somebody who must have thrown into New York at least 50 times, the first time I flew in after 9-11 and seeing that gaping hole in the skyline. But to our school children, of course, 9-11 is history. And that's why works like this charity and the resources that since 9-11 have produced are so important. So I'm extremely grateful to Peter and Jen for inviting me today and for organising this. I know you've heard from Malala's father this morning. I was prompted by Peter uh, to listen to Malala's speech over Christmas, the speech she gave when she won the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. And I have to say, it's one of the most moving speeches I've ever heard. It reduced me quite quickly to tears. And for those of you who haven't heard it, I commend it to you. Her example is, of course, an inspiration and reminds all of us that education should be a birthright and schools should be places where children feel safe and where they can freely talk and discuss controversial issues and different points of view. I'd like to talk about two intimately related things. Firstly, the role that all of us involved in education, whether it be as teachers, school leaders, parents or members of government, have in keeping our young people safe from the threat of extremism and radicalisation by being alert to it in schools. Secondly, as I say, intimately related, our role in educating our young people in school in a way which makes them much less likely to be radicalised out of school, in a way which equips them with those essential life skills, which means they will be successful in life and helps us build a united society which will stand the test of time. Some people, people would say that these things are all part of the same thing, but I think it's important to highlight the latter because education in our modern world is so much more than being about passing exams, critically important though that is. Just to set out the challenges, which I'm sure have been referred to already today, the global rise in Islamic terrorism is one of the greatest threats we face with groups like Daesh seeking to cause terror and division to communities across the world. And this includes here in the UK, where the majority of terrorist plots that have been disrupted since 7-7 have been linked to Islamist extremism. Their ultimate goal is to bring down our society. They are anti-freedom, anti-democracy, and they want to kill many of us in pursuit of that goal. It's as simple as that. Extremists today are using highly sophisticated communication techniques, including through social media, which allow them to influence the minds of the most vulnerable in our society. And the quality of much of their online material is of a very high standard. The impact that radical narratives can have on the lives of young people is only too clear when we consider the fact that children and young people are among the 850 people who have travelled to Syria from our country to take part in the conflict. Of course, this is just one form of extremism impacting young people and their communities. The appalling murder of my fellow parliamentarian, Joe Cox, and the anti-Semitic, homophobic and racist views promoted by the now-prescribed group National Action demonstrate the ongoing need to challenge far-right ideologies. And extremism is more likely to take hold in communities that are divided. A lack of integration can lead to reduced opportunities for certain groups, which in turn can create divisions and resentment. Isolated groups will also be less resilient to the threat exposed, posed by extremism because divisions in communities can be exploited by those looking to recruit. In the inter introduction to our excellent review recently published into Opportunity and Integration, Dame Louise Casey sets out the issue very simply. Where communities live separately, with fewer interactions between people from different backgrounds, mistrust, anxiety and prejudice grow. Conversely, social mixing and interactions between people from a wider range of backgrounds 
can have positive impacts, enabling people to get on better in employment and social mobility. And her report also gives an example of a school in which children believe the population of Britain to be between 50% and 90% Asian based on their own personal experiences. This is why the Department for Communities and Local Government is working on an ambitious new integration strategy and it's vital that the government and education sector work together to make sure that we curtail feelings of mistrust before they escalate and harness the benefits of in integration. At the heart of all our work is the mission to keep our children safe. For teachers and school leaders, this means making sure all staff are confident about what to do if they have a concern. We know teachers across the country are already doing this very well every day for issues ranging from drugs, gangs, bullying and online grooming. Working with young people, you are in a position to notice changes in behaviour and will routinely be making professional judgments on the action that should be taken in each case. For the majority of schools, thankfully, the cases of suspected radicalisation will be rare. But when it does occur, the impact can be far-reaching for the young person themselves and as well as their families and their communities. We know that some teachers lack confidence in implementing the Prevent Duty, which was introduced in July 2015. Some might be concerned about backlash by the community. Some might be worried that a channel referral could stimulate a pupil and in turn stigmatise a specific community. This might particularly be the case if they have seen some of the misreporting in the media of cases where teachers have used their professional judgement and sought help. Despite how the media might sometimes choose to report it, our experience is that teachers are already highly skilled at safeguarding. Both Prevent and the Channel Intervention Programme are about protecting very vulnerable people from being drawn into terrorism and ultimately about protecting communities. It's about early intervention and working with young people to keep them both and them and their communities safe. That's why we were pleased to see in a recent study that over 80% of senior leaders in schools said they were confident in implementing the Prevent Duty and I'm sure that confidence will grow over time. This isn't just about the role that teachers can play, but also the support that we, as government, can provide. We know that it's important that schools are supported on the ground. We don't want teachers to feel isolated in tackling these issues. Having already established the role of prevent coordinators to facilitate engagement between organisations at a local level, the government introduced a number of prevent education officers to work with schools specifically. We currently have seven prevent education officers who support schools by providing advice and support on their compliance with the prevent duty and by highlighting helpful information that is tailored to local issues. In recognition of the very important role that schools play in tackling extremism, we are exploring what additional resources we can make directly available to schools to support them in this. Additionally, to help support schools, we have developed a website, Educate Against Hate, which I know many of you are familiar with and have used. And for those who haven't, I strongly recommend you pick up a leaflet here today and go on and explore it. It's proved very popular, it's award-winning, and it's received many thousands of hits. It was set up jointly by the Home Office and the DfE to provide teachers, school leaders and parents with the information, guidance and support they need to challenge radical views and keep their children safe. It brings together a range of resources for different age groups, all of which are available free of charge, so the advice and guidance on implementing Prevent is together in one place. And last week we revealed an update of the website which makes it easier to use and search for answers to questions. But it also goes far further than prevent by helping schools develop that essential wider curriculum to enable pupils to be active members of an integrated community so that they, as I say, are educated in a way in school which makes them much less likely to be radicalised out of school. Their inquiring teenage minds are high risk and, and their high risk tolerance must be satisfied in school and issues of the day debated with confidence so that they are not frustrated in their school life and finish up in a search for belonging or identity or male role models online in the evening and depressingly quickly finish up on some dark website talking to a Daesh recruiter. Different areas of the country will be facing different challenges and it's important that schools are able to account for this. 
However, no matter the local situation, all students will benefit from developing the knowledge and skills to identify, challenge and reject extremist ideologies and narratives. These include building their resilience, confidence and judgment, arguably the most important skill in my view in life, judgment. Their ability to think critically, understand the point of view of others and form and make and articulate well-evidenced arguments and hold through this a positive approach to life. And as the Sutton Trust has recently <coughs> pointed out, Harvard University tell us that these essential life skills are at least as important as qualifications to success in life. We know that to develop these skills, students need a lot of practice. For years, English teachers have been teaching students how to look critically at media reports to distinguish between fact and opinion, and evaluating the reliability of different sources and deciphering motives is, of course, critical to the study of history. And many schools have debating clubs, and, of course, role-playing through drama is also very important. I also believe that all children educated in our country today should, through RE, understand the fundamentals of all the main religions practised here, because how can you respect someone if you don't understand them? This will also enable us to understand how common the values are between our different religions. And of course, mixing with pupils and people from different religions, communities and schools is so important, and we're seeing an expansion in schools twinning with each other, and we are developing programmes to promote this further. When I speak to teachers and heads who are proud of their, the way they're implementing Prevent, they point to the fact that teaching about fundamental British values needs to be embedded, not just throughout the curriculum, but as part of the whole school ethos. We need to show our pupils, through our country's long history, that we didn't just arrive at our fundamental British value rules because we have been shamed or guilt-tripped into behaving properly only recently. These values have been honed over hundreds of years, are long and deeply fought for and embedded in our society. But I won't say too much about history because I know that the speaker who follows me is one of our top historians in the country and I'm certainly very much looking forward to what he's got to say. In France, since September 2015, after Charlie Hebdo, all schools are required to teach a certain number of hours of French citizenship. We are not as prescriptive as this in this country as a government. We rely on our teachers and our head teachers. We trust them to work out what is most appropriate for their own student population. But that is not to say that it is not absolutely vital. We have seen outstanding examples in schools like those run by the Torhedal Education Trust and at the Manchester Islamic High School for Girls of this. And I'd also like to pay particular tribute to Kamal Hanif of Waverley for the work he's done uh, across Birmingham and across the country in supporting schools in this area. And it's, it's great to see so many pupils from Waverley here today. Schools like this have, have been helped in their effort by the work of organisations such as since 9-11 whose ex expert teaching resources are included on our Educate Against Hate website. To build pupils' understanding and resilience of extremism requires teachers to hold debates and discussions on difficult top topics, and since 9-11's materials support them to do this, and I know you've had quite a lot of discussion about them today. And I know a lot of research has gone into preparing, preparing these. When we look at, at the department at what to include on Educate Against Hate website, we consider how easy it is for teachers to use. We want the resources to help teachers so they can focus on their delivery, not make things more confusing so that they have to spend even more time planning how to corral information into a lesson plan. The Since 9-11 education resource is exemplary in this respect. However, while we are still hearing that teachers need more support, we will continue to work with education professionals and civil society groups to identify and produce high quality resources to further assist you in building pupils' judgment, critical thinking skills and resilience to extremist ideologies. For example, this year we were producing resources to help teachers lead knowledge-based debates on topics relating to extremism, fundamental British values and contemporary political and social issues. I'm also sure that there are a lot of good resources out there that are being used in classrooms which have not been shared more widely. Hopefully this session 
will inspire some conversations about what each of you are doing already in your schools, as well as areas where you can go further. And if you have resources which you think could be usefully added to our website, please do let us know. The battle against terrorism, radicalisation and extremism is, sadly, not going to be won any time soon. It's a battle that may take several generations and 50 years to win. But we need to win it in order for our society to survive. We need a revival of cultural confidence in Britain. For too long, we've kowtowed to a political correctness that has shirked the issue that we all live in one country with a long foundation of tolerance and inclusion, and that it is perfectly possible to be a Muslim or a Jew and a proud Briton. If we do not do this, our cultural message can appear weak, flabby and disjointed compared to a clear marketing message from Daesh or extremist right-wing groups. As I said at the beginning, I was deeply touched this Christmas by Malala's story. We will only win a battle of ideas, a contest of passionate beliefs, if we have bigger ideas that we passionately believe in. Many of you will have your own stories upon which you draw inspiration, confidence and perseverance. At its core, this agenda is about protecting young people and maximising their life chances, and these things motivate all of us. There is no role in our society more highly geared to its future than education. So can I thank all of you here today who are teachers and, and, and senior leaders for everything you do. And once again, I'd like to thank Since 9-11 for organising this event and inviting me to speak. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Can you take questions? This, yes, sorry, this, we've just got five minutes or so to take questions. I think it's pretty spirited um, of our Under Secretary to, to do this. Um, so, are there questions you'd like to uh, fire in his direction? And if not, we can move on. I know it's Friday afternoon, I know people have got places to go to, but this is a great opportunity, and then there's another one coming up with Simon. Yeah. yeah. The question was about RE, the, 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 the feeling that RE is on the decline in many schools, and is there something the government could or should do to promote the teaching of RE? Yeah, well, as I said, I, I believe that all schools should uh, teach about the fundamentals of all main faiths, and this doesn't actually happen in all schools, uh, but I think it happens in many. Uh, we are constantly being asked by people to add RE, citizenship, PSHE, all sorts of things into the curriculum, and... And we're constantly being told by teachers that we have a crowded curriculum. So, we, as I said earlier, we are not that prescriptive, or certainly not that prescriptive yet, um, but which is something we are certainly encouraging all schools, all schools to do. One of the feelings that seems to have emerged from, from today so far, and it, it echoed something you were saying about the sharing of ideas, the sharing of resources. I think that uh, there's a lot of that starting to happen, and I think that the will is for that to happen. But in some of the questions that the floor put to the panel, and some, one or two that weren't able to be answered, there was this undertow of wanting real reassurance that standing up to extremism in the classroom, standing up to the, 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 the various forces from outside, was, was something that could be tangible for teachers. And, and you've hinted, or you've sorry, not hinted, you've said already that that's in place, but the scale of that support, I think, would be a critical issue for many people. But I understand that, and, and of course, I, I hate to ruin your Friday afternoon and mention Ofsted, but um, it is something that Ofsted is very focused on, increasingly preparing children for, and young people for life in modern Britain, and uh, it is certainly central to our whole inspection regime, SMSC, uh, in, in schools. Further questions? On which note, nice and succinctly, thank you very much again. Thank you.